it's quite easy to say, don't have enough time. We will never have time. We need to make the time to reconnect with food because ultimately, as we all agree, is what we put in, we get out. And when we make that time to go and shop with purpose, shop correctly, put our meal plan together, if it's at home or in, in your workplace, that is ultimately what's going to come and give us the fuel for the day to succeed in whatever we do and give us that balance which we all need. Well, hello everyone and welcome. Welcome to another episode of the Find an Equilibrium Show. I'm delighted to be here, delighted that you're here and delighted that today I have two wonderful guests. I have Leo Gastray, who is the National Executive Chef at the Compass Group. I hope I pronounced that correctly. And Johnny Niche, who's the GM of Brand Development, also at the Compass Group. And today we're going to be talking about, I think it's one of my favorite topics, which is about food and not just eating food, but the impact that food has on society, because we all love to eat. So so welcome to the, the Fine Equilibrium Show. How are you both today? And where are you both uh, uh, speaking from today? Chefs first, Leo. Thank you, Johnny. Uh, thank you, Lawrence, for having us. Um, I'm I'm at home today. Um, I had a busy day yesterday. I was on a global call last night, and yeah, I'm I'm at home. And I'm ready to to share um, all my insights, and um, yeah, I'm I'm quite excited to be here. Great. Yeah, Good Lawrence. Thanks. Uh, thanks for having us. It's been great talking to you up to this point, and. You know, both Leo and I want to share our stories and very different. We work for the same company. We have very similar sort of family backgrounds, but very different jobs. And it's going to be super interesting going through some of this. Um, in terms of where I am, Sydney at home today, working from home. Do you know what? That has been a substantial change to people's lives, working from home. And when we when you ask that question later, finding equilibrium, I think you're going to know part of my answer already, working from home. <laughs> Cool. So, so maybe let's start by just uh, introducing yourself more fully to the to the audience. I'd love to know. Maybe we'll start with you, Leo. So clearly, yeah. uh, you're in Australia, but I can tell uh, you're not an Australian. And the same for you, Johnny. So, I'd love to understand, Leo, how you got to be um, the executive chef at the Compass Group. You know, one of the biggest brands um, in in the hospitality space. So, I'd love to understand a little bit more about your journey. Yeah, sure. Um, so, I grew up in Austria. Um, born in Austria, raised in Austria. Um, dad is a butcher and a chef. Mom is in hospitality. She's a restaurant manager. So we always had to approach the sort of, we have a little farm attached as well, you know, live right in the mountains. So like picture perfect, always with waterfalls and, and the likes. And um, yeah, we always had the approach of farm to table. And that really sort of shaped me through my childhood. And then, you know, when it came about, oh, what, what is Leah going to do moving forward? For me, there was only one thing. I wanted to be a chef because I love food. I, I love what food can do. I love what stories we can tell and what impact we can have and obviously traveling the world. So I completed my apprenticeship over there in a, in a small hotel, which was quite nice, family-owned hotel. And then I moved to London because I really wanted to see the big city life and what it was all about. And I gained some amazing experience there, made some really good friends and um yeah, I sort of found out about a little bit about Australia and Sydney. And I was like, yeah, let's go and check it out as I'm wild and free and I can travel. And, you know, I'm a passionate chef and I arrived here 18 years ago. Wow. 18 and years. Um, was working in some of Michelin star and had a places for around the world. And when, and then 11 years ago, I, I joined Compass Group as an executive chef at one of their sites, which really showed me sort of the bigger picture of hospitality and the global impact we have. And then four years ago, I was promoted to national executive chef. And so now my role is really to nurture our talent, you know, do the out of the box thinking and being really creative, but also, you know, um, working with people, making them understand what food can do to themselves, to their bodies and, and, and how they, you know, can, can, can just find more of a balance that way. So yeah, super excited. My job changes every single day. 
and just love working with people and putting those smiles on our customers and people's faces. So I, yeah, it's amazing. I, I love that. Thank you for sharing. And and Johnny, like over to you now. Again, not not a. I, I can tell you're you're uh, you uh, originate from in exactly the same place that, that I did. So from from the UK. So tell us how you became the the GM. It sounds like a, you know a big role with a lot of responsibility. Yeah. Look, I'm very grateful for. First of all, living in Australia, I've got an Australian wife, three Australian children. It's I'm soon to be Australian. I hope, fingers crossed, let's do that test and sing a few songs. Um, look, I started in the UK, uh, born and bred in the southeast, the Garden of England. Definitely a country bumpkin. Grew up in the country. Had lots of memories of, you know, g- garden food, growing, running around in cornfields. So. I, went through the scout movement i've done lots of outdoor exploring and stuff i consider myself an outdoors person um but then um moved to the city worked um and and i've lived in cities since actually so i i I long to retire back to the country at some point in my life that's my aspiration in terms of work look i fell into hospitality by accident i'm probably like a lot of the listeners one of those people that had no idea what I wanted to do in my late teens and um, failed a few exams at high school and had to go to college in the UK afterwards and reset a few of those exams. And then I started a um, a, co- a college course that would be a, a link to get me to university. I did hospitality and catering at college for a year to get me onto the university course. And then I did um, hospitality and catering management at university, which is a very broad course. It has things like, you know, learning how to be an executive chef, for example. It had traditional culinary modules as well as French furniture and fittings. Computers at that stage were very, were very early and um, simple and were all about hotel reception and things like that. So that got me into it. I actually then left university, which I did in Edinburgh, a beautiful city, uh, have lots of friends there still, and went to work in restaurants, pubs and nightclubs. I kind of took a fork, the wrong fork for me, which was more into beverage than food, um, but did learn a lot and um, managed some very large operations, including a large um operation nightclub and pub in Cardiff which is just a fantastic city if anybody's ever been there it's a brilliant city rugby city um, and saw lots of good stuff there and then I managed to get a role in the company I worked for in their marketing team um, as a um, trainee marketeer and um, I did I, I worked through the ranks I did my stripes I was a you know a brand manager then a commercial brand manager and then managed a large restaurant chain in the UK um, from a marketing and brand perspective that was awesome and then um, moved across to Compass Group in 2009 so I think between Leo and myself we've got some significant tenure at Compass I worked in the UK as marketing director for a number of sectors in Compass for a number of years, and then was fortunate enough to work as a um, account director for one of our large global tech companies. And that um, afforded me the chance to travel around the world. And I think that's at that point in my career, in my early 40s, when I started to realize the culture of food and how different cultures really use food as a way to help employees and and individuals get the best out of life and i did that for four or five years and managed to get a transfer with my wife to australia in 2016 very grateful love it here this is just amazing part of my career working with people like leo amazing well thank you for sharing that i want to move on now because you've both had years and years of experience working in food working in hospitality restaurants bars you know like you've seen every uh, every um touch point one thing that struck strikes me and this is you know from my own perspective that often people don't recognize the real um impact that food has often we're seeing food as something we and maybe it's part of our culture it's certainly the culture in the uk or it's become like food is convenience uh, we have to eat very quickly we have to prepare food very quickly but i'd love to understand because i know you have a lot of data a lot of research what 
the impact of food has. So when you think about it, you know, food really makes up our bodies. You know, it's not like an adjacent. You put something in your body, it becomes your body. And um, it's not just something we quickly eat was, uh, you know, rushing from meeting to um, to uh, to meeting. But often these are the behaviors that we're actually seeing in our culture. And I'm not criticizing our culture. It's just what it is. Um, but when you look at uh, when you look at society with your lens, what is the impact of um food on performance uh, because people struggle with food and um, for all all kinds of reasons so um and maybe johnny i'd love your your perspective on that yeah look uh, it's it's been a real journey hasn't it and I, I and and look i've got my own opinion and i'll also speak on behalf of our company because we've got a large responsibility to impact this area but people are individuals so i completely get their um, agenda around food and as you get older in life I think you become more aware of some of those inputs and insights and, and what they mean to you um, you know we often talk about the younger generations and that you know they think they're you know superheroes and you know they can eat whatever they like but actually the newer generations now are, are, are teaching us a trick or two around their eating habits and you know when we do our research we do research called eating at work every year and we we ask australians that are working um all of those questions around what they eat why they eat where they eat who they eat with why do they choose things like that it really does give us a glimpse into what it is people are doing and why they're doing I, look there's no new, we're not going to come up with any rocket science on this call. It's very straightforward. You're right, Lawrence, food is nutrition. And whatever you put in, it's the fuel that fuels our body. And if you put bad stuff in, it, your body can't perform as well as the good stuff, right? And and it's a balance of all of that. And I think look, Leo will talk about what you do with that food and the best ways to do it. But I can certainly talk about how companies now have put a connection between that data and food programs that we offer employees at work and of course it's not just about putting brown deep fried food that everybody loves and is flavorsome you know over the last 25 years if you think about how food has been commercialized we've moved from sort of transactional experiences where it's all about cost so very unhealthy food really you know some of those large qsr chains putting food out there for under a dollar it's not healthy but it's very accessible convenient cheap of course people are going to stuff their faces with it it tastes good as well it's pumped full of salt and umami and all of those things it tastes amazing half an hour later it doesn't taste so good but I think, look, we've moved from a transactional economy now in food to a more experiential economy. And of course, people know what's good with the internet over the last 20 years. Every single data point's there at your fingertips and the younger generations are really leveraging some of that. They know what's good, what's not good. If you go on TikTok or, TikTok or Snapchat, you get some amazing recipes delivered in under 30 seconds that you can replicate at home. And it's all about simplicity for me. And Leo will talk about how to how to take that nutrition thing and and what are the best tips for for putting clean food inside your body. I love that. Thank you for sharing that. It's really interesting uh, because <laughs> that's a challenge. This. Um, food that is less good does taste really, really uh, amazing and is really cheap. So uh, in uh, in the current context, that's attractive. But but Leo, to bring you into the conversation now and, yeah. um, you know, behind you, you've got Plant Forward for people who are watching this on, on video. And the very first time I met you, actually, it would have been, I don't know, three years ago where I was at an event and you made a Rocky Road. It was incredible because it was what was incredible was it tasted amazing. But it was also made up of the most healthy ingredients. You know, I, I don't know how you did it. I mean, it's like a magician, but it was incredible, like absolutely incredible. And um, I'd love to bring that concept in now because I do see that as the solution, because often people think, OK, you can eat this very brown, unhealthy food that tastes amazing. Or you can eat these beans and rice, which are very good for you and greens, but do not taste to some people as good. But you've been able to, with your skill set, you've been able to um, solve that. So it becomes, you can create good nutrition that actually tastes amazing. So I'd love you to share more about, you know, this whole program or this whole concept that you call Plant Forward and what it is and, um, you know, and how um, how it works. Yeah, sure. Uh, first of all, um, to the point earlier, I, it, it excites me that people now with food come together again and we start talking again. Obviously, we've been apart for so long 
because of COVID, but now we're really using food to come together and have a conversation. And that's pretty much when you look at the the only time we really put our mobile devices and technology away and have a one-to-one -one conversation. So it's really good for us because we also start to appreciate the plate in front of us a lot more. So as you said, Lawrence, plan forward. Um, it's mostly misunderstood by people because they, they refer to it as a vegetarian or vegan diet. And then quite quickly you get those sort of like, oh no, I'm not interested because I like meat. I'm a butcher's son. I love meat. I've grown up on meat. <laughs> so, but the job is to actually make people understand what it's all about. So what we are saying is shift your diet, put something else in your body, which will help you feel better, give you more energy because you don't actually need to replace all that protein, which we're taking out, but maybe put that chicken breast mm. to the side, make it much smaller, help yourself, help the planet, help our future. So it's, it's really interesting. We came together as a big group of people, encompass globally obviously with our global network in 2020 and really like explored these options and what we think about it because as johnny said there's a lot of information out there and it's a bit like what are we going to do in the future how are we going to shape the future and then we had a couple of sessions where we really dug into it and extracted what do we need to do first to be successful and one thing was very clear we need to train our people to get the right message across and that starts with the chefs. I've been a chef for 25 years. As I said, a butcher's son. I was pretty set in my ways because it was always that way. But now we're pretty much telling chefs, shift your thinking. Do things a little bit differently. Mm. Put that protein to the side. Put those vegetables and grain to the center of the plate. Some people are really challenged with that. So we need to find techniques, like techniques we use with animal protein for as long as we can think from salt baking to marinating, the rubbing, to smoking. Let's utilize that in vegetable and make them attractive to people. Mm -hmm. So when they do go down that road and go, okay, I'm going to do something myself today. I'm going to change the way I eat because I know it's going to be good for myself and it's going to be good for, for the planet. Then when they dig in and have their cauliflower steak instead of their beef steak, they go, wow, I can replace one dish a week, maybe two with a plant-based diet moving forward. And that's really what we're driving for. We're not saying, hey, forget about all the meat, forget about all those wonderful things which we're used to. Just balance it. Because I think mm -hmm. as a society, we've got too carried away where in the morning we need our protein, at lunch we need our animal protein, and at night mm -hmm. we don't. Actually, it's the opposite. We need to mm -hmm. start having less of it. So I'm super proud of all the work we are doing. It's been challenging to, to a certain degree because obviously trying to convince a whole industry to think differently, but I think <laughs> now is the time. And really COVID started to help us because people started to look at their diet a little bit more and really yes. started to consider local fresh ingredients at the right time. Why would you buy peas if they're not in season? What's the mm. point of it? I, Go I for love, something else. Yeah, we I also, love that. Yeah, I love that. Yeah, we're also training a lot of people to shop with purpose, have a little bit of an idea what you're going to put into your body. And sometimes that's tricky because people just go to the supermarkets, wandering up and down the aisles and just pick things as they see them. So you need to have a little bit more of a plan. But I'm going to touch on that a little bit later once we cover something else. But yeah, that's how I see it. It's super exciting for a chef because I know that I have a responsibility and we all can start changing our industry and the way people perceive food and the way people eat food. But it's, first of all, food has to taste great because that is the opportunity we get now to really inject this into our society moving forward. And there's some great products out there. And it doesn't mean you have to put all this work in, especially when you're at home and people going to work and we're stressed and busy and you come home to your families and sometimes you want something nice and simple, but mostly those simple things are the wrong choices. You know, they're the, our chips and nuggets and I'm not saying there's anything wrong with it, but you don't want to have them too often. And I got children myself now, two of them, two lovely girls, and it's hard to feed them the right things. It's absolutely mm -hmm. tricky, but you can find really good techniques. Maybe, for example, take a burger. What about if you would only use half the protein and mix the rest of it with a mushroom? They wouldn't know the difference, nutritious, absolutely delicious, and we're steering in the right direction. So there's many little tricks, but yeah, it's mm. it excites me, and I'm so glad I can be part of this and shape the future to come. I, I, lo I love what you're saying, you know, because really what you're saying, and I think this is really the way we the, the the way society perhaps thinks is that it doesn't have to be all or nothing. You know, clearly if you're eating. Uh, 
too much meat, then, you know, the research shows that that puts a lot of stress on our digestive system. And um, so that's too much, but it doesn't be no uh, meat at all. You just need to exactly. increase the amount of uh, plants and make it delicious. Because one thing I have seen, like with the trend in, in a veganism is that often people are not eating animal products, but they're eating highly processed um products that are not actually good for their health but what you're advocating exactly. is actually be aware of you know it's really about good nutrition and um nutrition. and how you um create um magic with good nutrition so that people who may not want to eat um, their greens are actually eating their greens without even being aware of it you know so i love that i think i think it's, it's, that's it's, uh, that's really good yeah it's sometimes just Lauren, it's simple you know, yeah. just don't overcomplicate food, let ingredients speak for themselves. I think we got a little bit too carried away where we think like we need to do all of this stuff to something. Let's just buy these really good ingredients at the right time of the year, support our industry, support our farmers and put them on the plate in front of them and just enjoy them for what they are. And a little tip, I guess, for my side is try things as you buy them. Let's say you buy this carrot. Actually taste the carrot for once. Don't just go chop it up and do all the things we do with it. Taste the product which comes out of the ground. And that's with so many things. Eat that salad leaf before you dress it. Just to really appreciate the flavor. And there's someone out there who put a lot of passion and hard work into growing this. And we just need to be considerate of that moving forward, you know, because that way we really start to see what food is all about. Yeah. And um, then it's just like this trickling effect between our brain and taste parts and it just all comes together and then ah oh, it's a wonderful story there i love it i think we're a little bit biased because we're, we're obviously come from a food organization but we've done a little test case here we've done what we call shift workshops where we're trying to make this shift with our teams our culinarians and our site managers so that's the that's the pilot that's they're the guinea pigs and they're human beings too they're in society they're the same as you and i They've got their views on how much meat they eat or whether they're not, whether they're vegetarian or vegan. And what we did over a period of a year and a half now, we've had about eight or nine of these workshops where we bring that community together in a room and take them through a whole load of things. And the very first thing we did was take them through some of the insights in the industry. Why, you know, what are the volumes of people um, that are vegetarian, vegan, that are omnivores? And we also take them through insight around what different diets look like. And, you know, we, we come very quickly to the, the fact that older generations are typically omnivores and younger generations are typically very subjective about their menu descriptions. You know, they are um, ovo vegetarians or lacto vegetarians, and that's all good. And it's very important to them. And we also see that the younger generations switch between those diet types very regularly that's their prerogative it's of course but what what do we why are we telling our team this because they need to get their heads around it that this isn't you're a vegan or a meat eater this is the new world people are eating very broad different diets and they need to understand what they're made of we also take them through um a session called test your taste buds and this is where leo sort of talks about actually taste stuff I think we've forgotten a lot of what those raw taste sensations are like. And I would urge every listener to try this little test at home. Perhaps, Leo, you tell us the the um, five, uh, five or six uh, flavor profiles that we test. It's a really good little thing to try at home with your kids or your family. Yeah, sure. So what we did, we wanted to, obviously, natural flavors, because it's quite easy. One of them, for example, you know, sweet. So you could literally go to the, your pantry and, you know, get some sugar, I guess, and put it in your mouth and go, oh, that's sweet. But actually, you know, picking a fruit which is naturally sweet and trying it that way without adding something to it because we constantly, like, we are so controlled by adding things constantly if it's salt, sugar, sour, bitter, whatever it might be. For example, salty, capers, salty, naturally salty. Sorrel, naturally sour. And then we got a uh, Vidloff or um, endive or uh, radicchio. It's bitter. So it's really interesting. But then you got that umami flavor, you know, that savory flavor, which is um, so prominent in mushrooms. So just, you could just put a mushroom in the oven. You don't even have to add anything to it and just let it roast the sear a little bit and then eat it. And you get that natural flavor. So it's, this is why I was saying we don't need to go to that extent where we just apply heavy seasoning. And this is when people mostly go wrong and, 
you know, they just add a little bit too much and they take the actual flavor mm -hmm. away. And then everything sort of starts to taste the same instead of letting, again, ingredients speak for themselves. So it was really interesting presenting this to our team, as Johnny said, and then seeing their faces go, wow, didn't even know that. And it's like, these, these are all simple ingredients which are available to us every single day. Mm -hmm. We just forgot how to taste them. And there's obviously other examples out there. So yeah. yeah. And and look, the purpose is to not to teach them to suck eggs, pardon mm -hmm. the pun, but it's just to remind their bodies that there's all of these amazing flavors out there that are, are in natural ingredients that we get from the earth and, 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 and from animals, of course. And um, we call that flavor rules. There's a couple of other principles we take our team through. Moving plants to the center of the plate is really important. And that's about not removing animal protein, but not making it the hero. You know, mm. so often meat and two veg. Really mm. what we're talking about is two veg and meat. Yes. So we're trying to sort of build up that. Um, really flips, mm. blends and swaps, you know, swapping stuff, blending stuff, reducing generally the amount of animal protein or removing it completely if that's part of your diet, that's okay. And then the last thing for us that we got to was sounds good, looks good. And often when you go, go to a restaurant, you look at the menu and the very last thing on the menu are the three vegetarian or vegan dishes. They're left to last. The descriptors aren't particularly great. They're not very attractive. We train our team to bring that to the front and really celebrate those dishes at the front of the menu, use more descriptive words and really show them off before anything like animal proteins. Amazing. Amazing. OK, look, I guess what goes through my mind when I hear you both speak is that there is a massive opportunity to really, mm -hmm. I guess, elevate energy through just upgrading the food that we that we uh, that that that. Uh, that we we that we um that we eat and there's also an opportunity because when i hear you 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 both speak it feels like we are reconnecting with what we already know you know leo you spoke about eating seasonally many people do not even know what's in season because um <laughs> because everything's Simply always right. available you know if you want to eat um, bananas are always you know so we've lost that knowledge and then you talk about taste and um many of those tastes are um unknown to us because we've become yeah. you know unaccustomed so it feels there's a big um, opportunity to reconnect but it does feel overwhelming i guess when people are listening to this like you said changing the mindsets of every chef and then changing the mindsets yeah, of yeah, yeah, yeah. all your employees so there are opportunities a lot of the work i do is around well-being at work you know and i've always thought if um you know we're seeing the trends in in uh, in the workplace very much around mental and uh, mental health issues and um, burnout these types of things and um, and there are lots of mm. solutions but often food feels like a hard thing to do in the workplace and i'd love to understand more about practical things that you can suggest that um managers leaders can actually do to really energize their team support their teams through something which is so fundamental but often can feel too hard for busy teams in busy time busy uh, businesses um there can be some resistance so i'd love to um just talk about the practical things from a workplace point of view and then we can also talk whilst we whilst we're having this discussion about practical things from an individual point of view um that we can do to really um upgrade the nutrition that's going into our bodies our families bodies our teams bodies which will upgrade the um the overall um you know the, uh, I'm trying to think of the right word, but the overall energy, let's say, um, within uh, a collective. Johnny? Yeah, look, um, yeah, I'll, I'll just dive in. Look, we work very closely with many different clients. And of course, they've got a very structured um, food program that they want us to deliver. And, and, and food programs are built around so, sort of pillars of collaboration, productivity, health and well-being, all of those sort of things that seem like impossible to activate in your home but it's not and if you if you take the framework or the fundamentals behind those from th those frameworks like nutrition wellness collaboration I, things like social interaction convenience education you can bring those into the home there's nothing stopping you doing that um so let me give you a couple examples um make meal times an occasion to socialize and that's a really easy one you know just get the screens off at dinner time set the table come around the table and you'll be amazed at how the focus becomes social and around the food it's very simple and you know it's hard to do that we've both got kids it's you know getting 
three or four kids around a table at dinner time is incredibly difficult and keeping them at the dinner table you know back when I was young you couldn't get down until you'd finish your dinner now it's kind of <laughs> we can't get them to the table so that that's just a fundamental one for me um make cooking at home about education cook together speak about the ingredients when you're shopping talk about the ingredients I mean Leo's given you some tips there mm. when's the last time any of us ever put anything in our mouth at the supermarket to try if it was any good I don't know I mean we don't do it do we but that's just try the food and one little tip if you've got cookbooks at home bring them closer to the kitchen because having them around the kitchen or having them on your on your your table that you eat with as a centerpiece people will open them and that will start to com you'll start to talk about food and then the last one perhaps I'll hand to Leo is the sort of fresh seasonal raw um aspect of it do more of that um you'll see the difference straight away yeah yeah no I agree kind of 100 I think for me is and that might sound a little bit harsh but we have to stop making excuses for not doing the right thing it's quite easily it's quite easy to say don't have enough time we will never have time we need to make the time to reconnect with food because ultimately as we all agree is what we put in we get out and when we make that time to go and shop with purpose, shop correctly, put our meal plan together, if it's at home or in, in your workplace, that is ultimately what's going to come and give us the fuel for the day to succeed in whatever we do and give us that balance which we all need. You start putting the wrong things in, your stress levels go up, your anxiety is going to go up, and it's not a good formula for success. So if we take that time and we stop making excuses for not doing the right thing and actually sit down and go, okay, as Johnny said, I dedicate this half an hour a week where I really sit down and I think about my food journey for this week, for Monday, Tuesday, all the way to Sunday. What am I going to put into my body? How am I going to do it? When am I going to treat myself? And quite quickly, what you start to realize is, oh my God, I'm constantly making the wrong choices. Mm -hmm. I just said protein, 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 and fatty things, fatty things. And Quite quickly, we start to understand and our brain starts to understand, we need to mix it up. What about we've forgotten about a grain or a vegetable or whatever it might be? And quite quickly, our whole balance shifts to something where we're more comfortable. We calmer when we go to work because we put the right things in. And we just, it, I almost explain it like for myself, when I make that big shift, and obviously it's difficult for a chef because we eat a lot of things every day. And sometimes I'm not saying I always eat the right things, but I, when, I, when I was looking at my diet personally and I made those changes, I noticed how I was changing. I was calmer. I was more controlled. I could deal with difficult situations a lot better. So this mm -hmm. is get on the journey. I know it seems overwhelming in the beginning and hearing it from a chef to go, oh, you have all the knowledge. I hear this all the time, but mm -hmm. it's out there. It is not that hard. Just mm -hmm. look at good food when you go to the supermarket look where food comes from we are a bit spoiled in this country because we get a lot of things all year round i gotta admit which is absolutely amazing but there's still things why would we import something from overseas if it's not in season don't buy it mm. and obviously now we need to make the right choices i mean uh, ingredients and food is getting expensive but there's a variety of stuff and try to mix it up and at home as well with your loved ones with your kids as john has said i'm going to do the same struggle i mean they like everything brown in my household, my kids. They prefer everything brown, but usually all the brown stuff is not the good stuff, unfortunately. So I'm trying to mix it up. I do cooking classes, little cooking sessions with my kids. And again, it doesn't mean because I'm a chef, I can do that. We can. We forgot about those things. Like I did, I did in my childhood a lot where I would go and make some biscuits or something with my grandma. Just spend some quality time. And you almost feel like you're actually losing that time of the day and you're not gaining anything, but you're gaining so much more mm -hmm. because this what puts us at balance and then what we gain afterwards is so much more. So, yeah. Stop I, mean, I, excuses. I, I mean, we come from a really good framework, don't we, Leo, in Compass Group, yeah. that, you know, we everything is a process in our business. So that whole intentional design of the food for the week ahead or the month ahead by our teams is there of course we don't do that at home I mean how many of the audience actually write a shopping list when they go shopping you know it, whether it's intentional or unintentional system one system two brain you know one one thinks just because they've seen the promotion in the supermarket I'm going to buy it the other's going no 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 I've got a list I'm going to stick to it 
if you can switch to that intentional shopping or planning your menu, you'll, you'll be amazed at the difference it makes. And of course, that's hard to do in itself, right? That's a big shift for a lot of people where they're busy working and they've got kids and everything's crazy. But if you do it, that's the first step. And look, there's a really quick hack there. And of course, not everybody can 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 get involved in those food subscriptions, but that is a guaranteed way to sort yourselves out and give yourselves a bit of time to start planning yourself. Just go on a four-week food subscription with one of those meal companies, and that will help you just clear some space so you can start to build your planning. You can then shop with purpose. You can try and look at more seasonal and local things. Um, and, you know, even shop with real intention, going to some of those seconds, you know, the ugly vegetables and things like that, where, you know, there is actually a link now, Lawrence, between that well-being feeling of doing something good for the planet to your own personal well-being, you know. And mm. I don't know how many of you guys, you know, when you finish doing your recycling or you've used a bit of food waste up, you get a little buzz because you're doing something good, right? That is good good feeling for me, doing good, feeling good, that can come inside and really make you feel better too. I love, I love that. I mean, what goes through my mind when, when, I, when I hear you speak is that food is really medicine. You know, that's kind of in the sense that, um, and even though we may eat for convenience, we're actually, when you look at it, you're actually, it takes more time because if you're eating something with poor quality, then of course that puts you in a, a worse state that takes away your energy, then you're not actually as productive as you are. So it's this, so, so what you're saying is if we can learn to almost become aware of what we're actually eating and shift. So some of that um, energy goes into planet. So you're almost planning with your head in terms of what you're actually going to eat. And I love your idea about those subscription services, because some of them are really good. I subscribed to one yeah. two years ago and actually, taught me to cook to be honest you know because um it takes you through it and you realize that it's not as hard as you uh, as you um as you may actually think but once you get into that rhythm then it sets you up for success for the day for the week for the mm. month for the year um so thank you we're almost out out of time but i i do was i've got you leo i would leo and johnny i would love to understand we've talked a lot about the transition of food, how important it is, how integrated it is, and how we've kind of shifted, like everything shifted, just what you were saying, Johnny, about, you know, when we were kids, you weren't able to leave the table. Now it's hot. <laughs> yeah. And you think the, the family dynamic has really changed. We always used to eat as a family. And now, of course, things are very, uh, very different. And the way we're eating as young people, and, we're, you know, I see this a lot in my work is that, diet or the way we eat can always become a religion you know i'm a vegan or i'm a vegetarian or i'm you know so it becomes this um, way of defining our, our self but as you look forward into the future and you see where we are i'd love to understand how you see the hospitality industry evolving and changing you know we had this you know let's call it dreadful period during the pandemic where all the restaurants all the bars were closed uh, and it made um, us made me certainly appreciate you know what we have have by just going into a restaurant and going into um, a, a cafe. Um, so now I I don't take those moments for granted in the way I did beforehand. Um, and mm. I'd love to understand how you things how you see things changing um, uh, in Australia or or in other regions. Do you want to go? I can. Yeah, I don't mind. Look, um, look, the pandemic certainly interrupted evolution of hospitality but it's back on track it's evolving again you know it paused um it had to sort of really look at itself and look at how it could still go given that nobody could access real hospitality it sort of went digital didn't it for a bit and of course we've got economic pressures now the current environment inflation rates going through the roof food prices going up so you know um at one end of the spectrum and then you've got these ridiculous experiences in hospitality at the other end of, uh, of the spectrum um i think the covid pandemic put a spotlight on personal health and well-being people really looked at um how they could use food to support their journey um foods health health's always played a part in us and what we deliver in Compass Group, nutrition and well-being. But but now I think hospitality is looking for more functional ingredients. I mean, just the other day I um, I sampled a sparkling flavored water, and I thought, wow, that was pretty tasty. Yeah, nice. That's good. Nice and healthy. And then 
like 10 minutes later, I'm thinking, well, something's going on here. What's going on? And I looked at the ingredients and there's like the same amount of caffeine is, as in one of those energy drinks in it. So people are looking to bolt on or get fast nutrition quickly um, through retail products. So that's good. Experience continues to move up the priority list for consumers. Um, and that can be via ingredients, of course, you know, more premium ingredients, the way it's served, you know, a different type of service, you know, you've got restaurants where you're blindfolded and you taste the food, you know, it's really? incredible okay. use of your senses. And then oh, of gosh. course the environment which your food is served in, whether it's a standard restaurant or something exceptional. Um, and then finally, you know, we, we the pandemic's really made us stop as a race and think about the environment. And of course, food and beverage is a massive drain and a carbon contribu contributor. And um, I think as an organization, it's really made us think, you know, we've got a huge responsibility to do better around sustainability. Consumers are telling us through our research that um, um, clean and simple labeling's really, really important plant for forward options are really, really important. 50% of our consumers are telling us if you haven't got plant forward options on the menu, we're just not going to purchase from you. Really? So it's not about being vegan and stuff. Wow. It's massive. Wow. Yeah. 50%. And that number rises, of course, as you get to the younger generations. So it's massive. But, you know, hospitality has to shape shift. Okay. Mm. We've got to wind our way through the cost pressures, through sustainability. We've got to have less impact and we've got to add more value through nutrition and healthy um, attributes. That's my gut feel. Yeah. I'm going, to, I'm going to add to this, and I like what you said earlier, Lawrence, that now you go to a restaurant and you appreciate it more. And I feel like throughout the pandemic, obviously, hospitality got hit really hard. And unfortunately, a lot of those professionals, chefs, waiters, front of house, they left us because for so long they've been, you know, hospitality was always this safe one. It doesn't matter what happened, you will always have a job. And suddenly it was all standstill and they had to do something else. Mm. And it, not all of them came back, understandably. Mm. But now what we're saying is that people like yourself, Lawrence, really start to appreciate hospitality more, appreciate how much passion and time these people put into it. And that really helps us now to recruit these next chefs, next culinarians coming through. It's a bit slow, I admit. It's a bit of a challenge at the moment. But I think the formula is right because we look at things differently. And that really excites me because we, always had, we almost had this stop and go reset. And as Johnny said, we look at our planet, what have we done to it? Nutrition, all of that is important, but so is to control our food waste. We waste so much food every single day. The average household in Australia weighs 300 kilos of food a year. That is an enormous amount of food. Shocking, yeah. Globally, we actually produce a lot of food, enough food to feed everyone. But let me tell you this, one out of nine people does not have enough food on this planet. And we have to stop that. And we obviously got the power. As a large company, we have the power to make a real impact here and the change. But we all need to work together. This is why we need to be more cautious. What do we put in the bin? How do we purchase? And, you know, sometimes go, oh, that little bit which I do doesn't really, you know, add to it. Or let me tell you, it does. I don't know, a little bit of research. If you throw one burger in the bin, you wasted the equivalent of 90-minute shower of water just by doing that this is how long how much water it takes to grow that meat in an animal vegetables and everything which goes with that burger which is enormous amount of water we forget about the, the environment impact you know throwing things away there's lots of components involved and sometimes we forget about fresh water mm. you know if we turn the tap on every day and water just comes out but we don't really consider where does it come from and how much is actually available and we got people in other parts of this world they don't have any water. So it's really the right rate state of awareness. And I know it's very dark and it does it sounds like we got no way out of this. But we, when we all work together and all going is trying together, we have this positive impact. And yeah, I mean, we just have to do it. There's there's no doubt about it in my mind. Complete I mean, I couldn't agree more. I mean, I really couldn't. And it feels like um it's really just us as individuals um becoming aware, you know, aware because we have 
had things work behind the scenes you know the water comes out of the tap you know you go to the supermarket and exactly. it's locked and it's just so we, the way it always lo- is you exactly turn it on and comes out <laughs> comes out and we've lost <laughs> we've lost that awareness and some of those skills as well even cooking you know we we outsource cooking we outsource these things so it's really coming back to ourselves really that's what that's what i hear and it all it's almost like the fundamental underpinning and we see this through our research you know pr- primarily through the workplace is you know one of the big challenges at the moment is encouraging people to come back into the office and the reason they will go back into the office is for connection and that's That's what we need at at a at a a fundamental level but it's not just connection to each other it's also connection to the natural world i guess because we are we're dependent on each other and i think the indigenous people really get this and understand that at a much deeper level Mm -hmm. than perhaps we we've done because we haven't grown up in that way but i feel there is that shift and i completely agree that we can't change the world alone, but we can change the world together no. by connecting. Yeah. And, um, you know, we, you know, collectively, we do have a big responsibility because big companies obviously can access lots of people. And it's, uh, you know, I applaud yeah. you for the work that you're doing. I really do. It's, thank uh, you, thank it, it's, no, it, it's, it's amazing amazing. What, what power food possesses. Like you said, we got to almost earn that commute for people to come in to connect. Mm-hmm. And then if you throw food into the mix, nutritious, delicious food, it just starts to all flow really nicely and come together. I mean, for me, again, I do this a lot where I go to food courts and stuff and I just sit there and look at people, how they behave and what they do. And what what I find all the time is while they're still selecting and stuff, there's a lot of mobile phones and we're busy in our normal day-to-day world. And then as soon as we put that plate in front of us and someone sits with us, this conversation starts. And this is the most natural thing which we should be all used to doing, but we sort of <laughs> forgot about it mostly. And it's it's crazy to think. It, it's it, the same it, as we it. said, you know, with the water, you just turn the tap on and it comes out. So if we can build this connection again, and I feel like we're doing really, really well. I feel like that awareness is out there. People are more focusing towards the plan of what we can do because we started to see, and I always refer back when, when COVID hit and you saw sort of when they had the shot from the earth from above, how the ozone started to clear up, the... The, the rivers in in Italy suddenly there were fish in there again and in Venice and, and the likes it's just beautiful to see how we actually could quite quickly recover so hopefully we don't go in the opposite direction again I don't see it because I feel like there's a lot of knowledge out there and a lot of power from big companies to small companies to aligning people on that same journey but ultimately as Johnny said a little bit earlier you feel so good when you know you have done something good mm. it almost again gives you that energy, that well-being, that putting you at peace, in my opinion, where you go, you know what, I've done something good for me. I really help this thing. If it's food waste, whatever it might be, sustainability, and that's just a beautiful story and a, a, a combination to success for me. You really, uh, I, I completely agree. And it's the, and it's the tiny things that add up into big things. Like you that's may think, uh, funny, you funny. know. This, this is what we're saying is small steps <laughs> small in the right steps, direction. Yeah, but if we all do them, then of course you get uh, a huge yeah. impact. We're over time, but I do want to yeah. ask you that final question. And I feel uh, I feel we've kind of covered it in many ways. But, you know, this podcast is called The Finding Equilibrium Show because the belief that underpins it is that, everything is a balance um, at every level. And if we can find the right balance, and we've been talking about that, it doesn't have to be, you know, no meat and um, and only vegetables, but the balance is going to be different. And if you can get the right balance for yourself and your company and your team and your community, then of course, that's where um, the outcome is health and well-being, which is uh, what we want. I don't think anybody would um, would argue with me uh, with that. I think ultimately at some level, we all want good health and well-being and the drivers of, of those things. But what does finding equilibrium mean to you? Maybe Johnny, we'll, we'll start with you first. Yeah, look, I think like lots of your audience, for me, there's this constant battle with juggling the balls of life. So, for me, career, finance, health and well-being, then family and friends—they're the kind of four big balls I juggle, and I want to keep them all in the air, all all healthy and fit. And um, I think over the years, I found that. <clears throat> for me i'm very lucky i work in food so food's integral in my career it's integral in health and well-being and then of course integral in family and friends so there's a common denominator there and i found if i put energy into food and and, and shopping cooking and just like leo i'm not in any way the best practice here we have weeks where we're it's all gone wrong in our house and we've got nothing and we're eating microwave meals and stuff so 
please don't think that I'm some sort of hero when it comes to uh, family and eating well. But if you can work on the food bit, you'll find that it influences some of those other balls you're juggling. Finding equilibrium for me is, of course, feeling comfortable to take in another ball, I guess, and keep the juggling going. But that moment every day for me where I know I found equilibrium is when the kids have just gone to sleep and the wife says, are they asleep yet? And I go, yes. And we both go, yes. <laughs> and we have a moment of peace before we doze off to our own sleep. But um, yeah, that's it. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you, Johnny. And Le Leo, what about you? Uh, I'm going to have to go put the spin on them from a work perspective. So as a chef, I was a very tense environment. And there's a lot of planning, a lot of trial and error involved, you know, meeting with clients and all the wonderful things we do. And then it all boils down to this one moment where we finally get this plate and put it in front of our customers. And then when they eat that food, which is nutritious, delicious, which makes their day. And we had this experience throughout COVID because, yeah, we did a lot of catering for, for people in need at that time. And we saw how a simple meal can change their day and turn their day around. It's quite amazing. So when I get to put that plate and I see those smiling faces, then I am a perfect balance in that particular moment. Quite quickly afterwards, it's all hectic again. <laughs> but for that minute, five minutes, half an hour, I'm just, we, I just succeeded in what I plan to do. So the plan worked from A to B in front of the customers and I'm at peace. Obviously at home, a little bit like Johnny, <laughs> you know, when the kids go crazy all day and you sort of, again, you know, um, and I, I'm, I'm guilty myself. It's not perfect in my household either, you know, we struggle at times. But obviously the moment is, yeah, when the kids go to bed and you sit there and you sort of review the day a little bit and, and then I, I sometimes even challenge myself, how could I do it differently? How can I make a bigger impact and get that peace across my family? Because obviously when you stress at home and not the perfect peace, then that resonates with others, you know, yes. and, and with my kids. So I really try to find that at home as well. But it's, it's shown when I have a really good day, when I do a little bit of cooking and, you know, eat nutritious meals with my family and we had the proper conversation and sit down at the dinner table like I always did, did in my household that when I grew up, I walk away and I'm, I'm, I feel at peace. I can handle a screaming kid then, then running around, making a little bit of a mess. So mm. that, that's for me. Yeah. I, lo I love that. We're, and you both talked about this word peace, you know, which is really the yeah. kind of, that's where you kind of know when you've got that equilibrium, your own personal yeah. uh, point of balance. Listen, guys, thank you so much for sharing. I really appreciate you because um, I know how uh, how busy you are. And let me just take a moment to acknowledge both of you for the amazing work that you've done, the the, the careers and experience that has brought you both to, to Australia, um, which is which is amazing. And, you know, clearly we need to work together going forward because there are some big challenges, you know, we're not pretending there aren't there are some big collective challenges yeah. but you know together i completely agree that you know we have the solution because there are some really exciting and interesting solutions and change is hot we know that <laughs> so, yeah. but with awareness comes opportunity so thank you guys thank you so much where can people find out more about the work that you do um and uh, and the programs that you do please um please share um any resources with them um, with uh, with people yeah, look, Leo, you, you're all over Instagram. Um, I'll let you deal with that. But look, I think just head to our company website. There's so many resources on there. Compassgroup.com.au, um, uh, um, www.compassgroup.com.au. You'll spot us there. And, of course, we operate in many sectors. We we often say we serve people from cradle to grave, pardon that term, but we work in hospitals where people are having babies and we also work at the senior senior living end of the uh, of the journey as well feeding people with dementia and things like that and schools defense force tech banking all of that stuff it's amazing and we've got some really good insights for people wow amazing yes you really see every aspect of life yeah incredible incredible thank you so much for your time and uh, thank you everyone for your time and for your attention and we will see you see you soon take care now thank bye. you for having us thanks bye-bye